I say. And then you put the baby down. And, and like, you know, you just can't even unbend your arm, right? Now, you didn't notice that so much when you were holding the baby, did you? you that, that level of contraction in your muscles stayed in your muscles and you were able to maintain that for a long time without really noticing it. It was only when you let it go that you realised how painful that whole process really was, right? And muscularly, that's what happens in our body. It's only when you let it go or relax it that many times you start feeling the pain of what was there. And that occurs quite often. So many of us are full of pain, but it is so suppressed that it's only when we deal with our emotions that the pain starts affecting us. Right? So right at the moment, I've got some really strong pain in my lower back that's coming up through some unworthiness stuff I'm still dealing with in front of groups. And, and it wasn't there this morning. I woke up with a dream last night, uh, in the morning, this morning, of, uh, of women being really angry at me, like just lots and lots of women being really angry at me. And I had the same pain in my lower back. So already my law of attraction is telling me that this is about unworthiness with women and it's about women's anger projections towards me and how I respond to them. Does that make sense? Straight away I know that. Um, just by my law of attraction telling me those things. Is that also triggered as a result of in Libby's, uh, back? In Libby's case, she was releasing the grief about death, yeah. but connected to the grief, the reason why there's so much grief about death is because there's terrible feelings of missing, of missing out on things that you have inside of you. And that's related to these unworthy feelings which are connected to your lower back. So once you started allowing the grief to flow, now the unworthy feelings are being triggered. Does that make sense? And now, now Does it's... Does that trigger everybody else's Yeah. That's in a, what I mean. Yeah, that's right. In a, in a setting like this, yeah. she says that, and all of you who have the similar feeling will start feeling the same niggles, mm -hmm. right? So if you feel empathetic towards someone and start crying, because it's usually because you've got it within yourself, right? Definitely. Uh, great, she says. <laughs> but it's very true. Yeah, yeah. So, so understand that the beauty of even talking about emotion with everyone else is that, is that you will expose in yourself the emotion, but also the people you're talking to will have the emotion exposed within them. And, and it's a beautiful way of interacting and, and actually interacting at the soul level, clearing away different emotions. How many of you, just before you answer some more, the session I did in Yudlo, you know, where I, where I was crying and telling you about my feelings about women. You remember that session? Oh, yeah. For some of you there? Yep. Um, some of you have seen it on DVD, if you weren't there. And um, how many of you was pow were powerfully affected by me saying those things? Oh, yeah. yeah, so quite a few. Okay. And um, can you see just by somebody experiencing their own emotion, just the flow on effect it has on others? Just by doing that. And um, it's it's right foot, isn't it? Actually, it's my left. Sorry? No, it's my right. But I've now got an ankle problem in my left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's a right and left. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's my right heel, left ankle. Now. Yeah. Now this is where it's very important that you don't get really intellectual about this. You could then say, I'm getting worse. I'm getting worse. What's this doing to me? This, this, this process that AJ's recommend is wrecking me. Like, I've never, been, I've never felt so bad in all my life, right? Yeah. A lot of times that's what we feel, right? Isn't it? Now, what's actually happening is there's emotions now flowing in you, and there, there are certain emotions you've been denying for all of your life that are still stuck. And you'll start feeling these because you're becoming more and more and more aware, right? And ankles, ankles, it depends where on your feet too, but different things to do with your feet are to do with momentum and movement and forward direction and some of it's to do with physical direction, some of it's to do with spiritual direction, some of it's to do with how you direct yourself in regard to being a female or a male and all of these different things. So we could go through all of the things technically, but does that help you at all? 
It doesn't really, does it? Right, let's look at how am I feeling about this pain? Let's go into that. Yeah. Right, okay, so there's a big emotion. Yeah. So get cranky, you know, get out the baseball bat or whatever and away you go and yell and scream at the universe about, I'm doing this emotional work now and look at me, I can't get anything done. And, you know, really just go with, it, go with that emotion and connect to the grief that's underneath that. Does that make sense? It does, I mean, I'm not that cranky. <laughs> You're allowed to be cranky. No, that sounds great. That's cranky. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, that's saying everyone else has to look after me now. This is yeah, great. Like <laughs> yeah. So, what's the emotion there being driven? This feeling that I've looked after everybody else all my life. About time somebody looks after me. Can you yeah, see that? I can feel some swearing coming up. And Good. I'm quite happy to hear that you can swear. <laughs> do you think you can swear? Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> Haven't until recently, by the way. Yeah. Let yourself feel those emotions of rage coming up, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of this suppression that's happening in the body and the ankles. The ankles and feet and legs, we often push things way, way, way down. And what I've found is I had huge amounts of pain in my legs. So much so that I could work out physically. So there was a time period in my life when I did weights and I worked out my upper body went, you know, like like big and then and my legs stayed the same size they are now quite small and 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 nothing changed in my legs because there was just so much emotions in my legs that my body couldn't even recover from them physically yeah Yeah. And just get stuck. Is this, I heard you say, this is, you know, the best thing to do is pray. Is this where, really, the That's insight... all I, I don't have you to talk to. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so what I do, yeah, is I talk to God about all of these things. So, so when I'm feeling, like, really angry, I talk to God about how angry I am and what I'm angry about and why and, you know. Like, I'll give you an example. Last, a few weeks ago, um, I came to realise that I've had the projections of a couple of million spirits at the moment who are projecting huge amounts of anger and rage at me and who want to kill me, right? And, and I went through this really terrible feelings of despair about that, you know, because I feel like I can't stop it. I feel like I can't uh, get away from it. And I, I went through this emotion of feeling like I was God's whipping boy, you know, like um, the feeling I had was that um, because of the choices that, were, that I made in the first century to connect to God, now I'm the focus of all of this really negative attention. And, and I even went down the stage of like, like I'm the only person historically that has a name, uh, a swear word named after him, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, like I was in a dark place about all this, right? Really dark place. And, and so, you know, I'm there feeling like, yeah, everybody, as soon as they swear, they say, Jesus Christ, Jesus F from Christ, or whatever. And, and it's me they're aiming all that stuff at, right? That's what it feels like. And, and I've got that happening like 24 by 7, no matter whether I'm in the spirit world, sleep, or whether I've got it here. And so I went through these really terrible emotions of like, when is this all going to stop? And I just went through three or four days where I just cried three or four days. Um, just saying to God over and over again, I just want this to stop, I just want this to stop, you know. And, uh, and it took me that long to get through that emotion. Like, um, so allow yourself to actually feel the emotion itself, and even if it's directed at God, you know, say exactly what it is that you're feeling. But talk to God. Like, it's a, this is all about, we're, the reason why we're doing all of this is because in the end, you'll have a relationship that's one-on-one -on -one at one with God. Right? Now, like it, at the moment, my biggest emotions are feelings that God has chosen me in order to be the focal point of anger and rage 
of the universe, basically. And that's what it feels like to me at the moment. And so that's what I'm talking about with God, like what that feels like. Yeah. Um, not while I have this terrible unworthiness within me, uh, because I do feel it sometimes, but um, the terrible unworthiness within me began because I had these projections of anger and, and so forth from the moment I reincarnated. So from the moment I reincarnated, these like millions of spirits being angry with Jesus, and millions of people on earth being angry with Jesus just got funneled into me. And it's a, if you can imagine when you were, as soon as you were uh, incarnated, imagine from that moment on your mother hated you. That happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like the many mothers feel really angry about being pregnant, angry with their husbands about, or person who's had sex with them about being pregnant. And they focus, they focus all of that rage on that child that's in them. Now imagine how you're going to feel when you're born. You're going to feel this terrible feelings of unworthiness and terrible feeling that all you've been born for is to be kicked around, you know. And and many of many of you have that emotion, right? Because of your mothers having the emotion they didn't want you. Now, for me, it felt like nobody on earth wanted me, including my mother, but also nobody on earth. Nobody in the spirit world wants you know, wants to hear from Jesus anymore, basically. <laughs> and and that that causes like huge amounts that caused huge amounts of despair in me from the moment I was incarnated reincarnated. And I'm dealing with that now. I'm re releasing those emotions. So if if you can imagine like millions of people angry at you constantly and you'll get a bit of an idea. How bad is it when one or two people in your life are angry with you? How do you feel about that? Imagine a million people angry with you, how you feel about that. Like a million people with you being the focus, they want to kill you because they feel so much hatred towards you. And so it's pretty tough to absorb all of those emotions and then release them. People aren't really consciously, when they're going to Jesus Christ, they're not really consciously directing that. No, I know. But many are consciously directing anger at me. Even in a session like this, many are consciously directing anger at me. Yeah, well, if I was feeling not unworthy, then I could have a million people angry with me and I wouldn't matter at all. Would it? Yeah. Like I wouldn't have a hook into that. Yeah. But because I'm feeling unworthy and they projecting that emotion straight away, I'm relating to that. I'll talk, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about my own process to you so you can understand what's happening with a lot of your own emotions in your day-to-day -day actions as well. And that will help a lot, I think. Isn't everything that we've spoken, spoken about today, particularly the description that was carried in the South, isn't it all just instantly gone with non identification? Non because if you identify with your pain, with the future, with the past, with who you were or who you had to be, the cell memory will hold on. You're looking at things from a very metaphysical, metaphysical point of view, not from a soul perspective. But with identification, if you identify with everything, everything will affect you. If you don't identify with it, if you let If it affects you, it's because an emotion already exists in you. If, it, if the emotion of love only, if, if only the emotion of love exists in you, you would, you, you would be able to identify with everything and not feel any of it. No, 
No, but you see, what you're saying is if I intellectually no longer identify, then I don't have to feel any of my emotions in my soul. And I'm saying... You don't feel them, but you don't identify as that's me. That's why they're doing it to me and become the victim of it. But the truth is, for many emotions, we do feel it's me. <coughs> the truth is, for many emotions, we do feel that it is very personal. What you're doing is you, you are skipping over this whole processing point because you want to. So, so at the end of it is what you say. Yes, you will not at the end of it identify with it all because you'll have dealt with all the emotion. But in between, you're going to have to feel the emotion. It's going to have to be real. Yes, you do feel it and you sit in it. And you no, I'm sorry. You, when you say, I can feel your emotion when you say sit in it and you are not feeling it when you're sitting in it. When you, when you are sitting in it, you are actually not experiencing it. Experience it. Like, what's the difference between sitting in anger and experiencing anger? Can you tell me? If you were really feeling anger, what would you do? You would act. You would act. Right? You would act. Now, now, if you sit in it, you are not acting, so therefore you are not feeling it. This is a common, there is a common viewpoint today that you can sit in an emotion to experience it, and it is not true. Now, you can try it, and you can intellectualize yourself away from your soul, but in the end, your law of attraction will demonstrate to you that you haven't dealt with it. Because the law of attraction changes the instant you really deal with it at the soul level, right? So, for example, let's say there's something occurred today. I was driving along, line, uh, I was driving along in my car. The car, another car cuts me off. Today, I get angry about it. So, you know, they cut me off, hand on the hooter, you know, just to let them know that it was, you know, out of line, and straight away expression of my anger or whatever. So that happens today. Then I work out tonight, you know, I've been getting cut off a lot. I need to deal with this differently. So I go down this intellectual track now of saying, what I'll do is I'll just sit in it and I won't act upon it. Now, you will feel better doing that. Does that make sense? You will feel better doing that. But you are not being real because you know what's going to happen? Today, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, you're going to keep getting cut off. The only time you know when you've really dealt with it is from now on, you never get cut off. In fact, people let you in. <laughs> right? And it happens automatically. Right? That's when you know you've actually dealt with the emotion. And they are. Because when you don't identify, it's just traffic. No, but see, this is what you do to avoid the emotion. The truth is they did cut... No, but the truth is they did cut you off. They didn't cut me off. I was behind you and they didn't do it to me. They did it to you. But see, this is where you go emotionally. You ask yourself why it should matter. The law of attraction is already showing you that this is already happening to you because there's an emotion in you that you don't want to love. That you don't... No, it can't because that's not how the law of attraction works. The law of attraction doesn't work without you having an emotion. The law of attraction works only because you have the emotion. So if you're angry with someone, you want to hit them, you don't hit them. No, you don't hit them, but you go and hit something else and express your anger. If the emotion doesn't become physical, it's because you're suppressing it. And you, you, and to be honest with you, what is your name? Elise. You are so used to suppressing your emotion, you've now come up with so many intellectual reasons why you should continue doing it. And it's going to be very difficult for you to keep on this track and understand what I'm saying to you. Because at the moment you are trying to justify why you should not have to deal with the emotion. And I'm saying to you, you can, you can believe whatever you wish to believe. That is your free will. You are allowed to believe it. I'm not going to want to change you. However, I'm going to say to you, you will never connect to God this way. Because to connecting to God is about an emotion to emotional connection, and that means being real with all of our emotions. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. yeah. So, so, and you, the reason why I say this to you is that my mother does exactly the same as what you're doing right now. And that is she has come up with all these intellectual constructions of how to best get away from dealing with the emotion. And she's, she's learnt to disidentify with the emotion. 
to realise that it's the other person that's, caught, that's got the emotion, not herself. And what she's doing in all of these processes is ignoring one particular fact, and that is my law of attraction is going to continue to attract these events to me until I realise the truth, and that is this emotion is in me still whether I want to believe it's in me or not. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Your law of attraction will continue doing that until you get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my law of attraction at the moment is my mother has gone slowly, painfully, and she doesn't want to deal with it too much. And I try to deal with it myself. So I'm finding it hard to work out like, what's mine. I don't know. I just, I don't know. That is my law of attraction, that there's a lot of stuff there that I don't want to deal with, isn't it? That she's helping. Um, yeah, firstly, obviously, it's her law of attraction that's created her death in the manner that it has, not yours. But your law of attraction in that it's your mother who's created that and is obviously related to many of your emotions. And I'm saying that she is creating her own death, not you. So it's not your law of attraction creating her death, if you like. She obviously is doing it because of her emotional condition. That's number one to remember. But obviously her emotional condition does affect you and there are a lot of unresolved issues between yourself and mum that you would like to address at times and she doesn't want to address and that's affecting you quite a lot. And my suggestion is to allow yourself to address those particular issues. Now you can do that without actually speaking to your mother. You can actually write letters as if you are speaking to your mother and do lots of things to help you deal with those emotions. But you are right, this event occurring is being drawn out to help you access these emotions as well. Yep. And so, will that just help me, like when I resolve those things, will that help me deal with it? Totally, yeah, mm. totally, yeah, yeah. You, you will get to a point in the end where you realise that all of what's happening to her is her choice and you won't feel responsible for it and you won't feel like you know there's terrible grief about that and all of those kind of things once you work your way through your own emotions yep Um, it depends how you act out the anger, but but what you have done is actually. How many of you believe anger is wrong? Wrong, wrong. You should not experience anger. How many of you? Get your heart. If that's what you feel really. How many of you are really worried about how it's going to affect everyone around you if you're angry? Okay. How many of you feel that from God's perspective it's got to be wrong? How many of you feel that anger and um, is a terrible feeling inside of you and you'd like to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> okay. On the divine path, you choose to not avoid any emotion at all. You choose to experience every emotion, which includes rage and anger and other emotions. Does that make sense? Now, our choice to avoid it is based on fears. It's based on different things that we're afraid of inside of ourselves, right? And so, so not acting upon your anger when you feel angry is already in another emotional injury. Can you see that? Yeah. It's already an injury of judgment of the anger. Or judgment, if, you, if you're not acting upon your jealousy, judgment of your jealousy. If you're not acting upon your envy, judgment of your, en of your envy. Now when I say acting upon it, I don't mean go and project it at the person, because that, that is certainly not taking responsibility for it. I mean feeling it 
and actually feeling it inside of yourself and expressing and experiencing it inside of yourself. Do you follow me? When you go and ex express it to the person, you are not only now damaging them, but you're damaging yourself even further because you are not taking responsibility for the underlying emotion that generated the anger. Do you follow me? So, in every case you need to experience the emotion that is there. So with anger, I allow myself to experience it without judgment. So I get out my <laughs> baseball bat, right? And I get out my boxing bag and away I go. Like, and because I allow the full expression of it, within 30 to 60 seconds, I'm on the floor crying generally. Because that's what it was covering, wasn't it? Yes. Remember the anger yes. or the rage is covering the feeling underneath of powerless and weakness and all those other feelings that I don't want to experience. Right? So by just expressing it, I am connecting. Now, if you try expressing it and it just dissipates, that's because you have a blockage. And the blockage is, I'm not allowed to be angry. It's not spiritual to be angry. God wouldn't want me to be angry. I'm going to hurt someone when I'm angry. And it could be a list of a hundred different things about your anger. Do you follow me? When you deal with that emotional condition, which is actually an error, you'll realize you're allowed to experience your anger, but you just need to do it appropriately, which means own it, feel it, experience and express it, and connect to what's underneath it in that one process. Sometimes you use the phrase angry with mother, father, God, whatever. Uh, it sounds like the other person's the cause of it. They could be or might not be. When if you get 30 people in a room and they're all angry, and they're all angry for different, they think different reasons, mm -hmm. aren't they all experiencing the same emotion? Yes, but it's very important who you're experiencing it with. I mean, who you're projecting it at? Yeah, yeah. So here's God. Here's you. Let's say you're angry, but in this particular case, with God. But aren't you just experiencing anger and projecting on God? Isn't it just anger? Um, God didn't cause it, did he? Yeah, see, now what you're trying to do is skip over again. You're trying to skip over. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't see... You're getting all intellectual about my wording instead of listening to what's going on at the emotional level. But and this is the danger that you have, Grant, is that yeah. of, you'd like to get... You know, you'd like to understand it intellectually before you do it emotionally. Yes, but the trigger isn't important, is it? The trigger is very important. It why? tells you everything. Why, why? How does it help you experience the emotion? Because the emotion is about the trigger. Yeah. That's like not according to my understanding. I know. It helps it's like the catalyst. Like what the causes. Is this what you're saying? Sorry? The nature of the trigger is helping you identify what the real source is. But isn't yeah. the source just the way I've been conditioned? No, but see, we can justify it all sorts of ways, Grant. The truth is that, let's say I am directing anger at God. Anger is always a cover of other emotions, right? Yes. So the anger is, I am actually in grief with God. Yes. I, there's something between me and God going on. It's not just anger, it's anger with God, so there's something between me and God. If it's, not, if it's anger with, like, Joe Blow, there's something between me and Joe Blow. Yeah, it's usually not, like, how many of your events that you are angry about actually did not include anybody else other than yourself? Can you think of any? You might think of one or two in your life, but it's very rare, right? Why? Because almost every single thing that's happened to you happened in an event with an interaction with another person, has it not? Right? And that tells you so much about yourself and your emotion and what's going on inside of you. And you can intellectualize that it's just anger, but it's not just anger. You're not saying, oh, if I just feel anger, you may have anger with 25 different people in your heart. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee to you, if you just feel anger, you are, you are going to have to go through the anger with 25 different people at some point. I'm not trying to get off the subject, AJ, but what about when you're working on something and you get angry? And 
I, I had that. I was a computer could consultant. Be the, could be someone, could be the, the work pressure around or whatever, the, the expectation of the end result. That, so it's always related to people and how they're going to think about you or people and what they've done in the past with you or, yeah, always related to something else. Yeah. And can I just go back to this because it's really mm -hmm. important, right? Because I'm interested in, we've been conditioned to not be responsible for emotions. I agree totally. So to me, identifying too much with the trigger has a tendency to project. Ah, but I'm not saying to identify with the trigger. I'm saying to be aware where it all begins. So I've got, I've got people here, here's me. I've got people all around me, right? So I've got you know, people in the spirit world. I've got God. I've got interactions with other people on earth, yeah. right? In every one of these interactions that I'm having with them, I may have different feelings. Right? Each one of those feelings prevents me from connecting with God because they're all feelings of error. Now, when I say I am angry with God, it's just a statement of fact that I am in a state of blame with God. Right? right? Now, I know it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Do you follow me? Yeah. How many of you know, you know, like, what's God done to you? A lot of people would say everything, and a lot of people would say nothing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But whatever the reason is that we will have feelings directed towards these people, entities, let's call them, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's God, people in the spirit world, or people, our friends here on earth, or whatever. And what we're actually doing is that we, we can do two things with that. We can intellectualize it into, oh, I'm just angry. Or we can focus on what we're angry with and let us go down that road, because that's where our grief is. Or we could just experience the anger and let it take us to our grief. No, but it won't, most probably. Why? Because we're not directing it. It won't build to the point that we're actually connecting, generally. It's not personal. No, it's not personal. And the truth is that every emotion in you is personal. Every emotion inside of you is personal. You know, like for yourself at the moment, there's lots of rage towards your father. You don't want to feel or experience that rage, right? So what you do is you just tell yourself, I'm angry if I just deal with the anger, everything will be gone but it's actually anger with dad and it's actually there's this feeling of not wanting to take responsibility for that for the grief within you that causes you to project the anger with dad but if you go down the track of feeling the anger with dad but instead of yelling and screaming at dad who's part, maybe past or is still on earth but doesn't really matter instead of yelling and screaming at him get out the you know bag or whatever and just connect with that anger but specifically direct it in that direction, right? In the sense of feeling it inside of yourself that it's all to do with that thing. And then just allow yourself to really experience it. And what will happen is you will then connect with the grief that's driving the, that the, there was a, there's a lot of things driving the anger. There's the anger, and then there's the denial, which you'll connect to next. And then there's the grief that's underneath the anger, right? So what you'll do is you'll step down into those positions as you do that. Now, if you just stay in this, as the saying goes in a new age term, you will not get down and down and down and down. You will actually just stay in it. And your body will tell you that you're not getting there. Your body will express to you and your law of attraction will express to you that you're not getting there. So, you know, when, it, when you're dealing with an emotion and you really deal with it, your law of attraction changes. <coughs> Instantly. Right? Instantly. AJ, could you explain the effect of that anger when you've got the uh, baseball bat and you're hitting the punching bag? Does, <coughs> that, does that punching bag represent the person that you're angry with? And what's the effect of that on them? Yes. Um, uh, rather than just if you were angry and thought towards them. Yeah. And um, the first step of, of your anger is denial of your anger. In that condition, you are projecting, unknown to you, and you are projecting the maximum amount of your anger to the other person. So when you deny your anger completely, you are actually projecting the most biggest amount of anger that you could experience is actually going to that person. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah. When you're in denial completely. Because everything you deny completely within yourself isn't passing through you, it's passing out of you. It's coming out of you. And it's going out to the universe, right? So when it's not passing through you, it is going out of you to the universe 
just getting expressed to the, to the people that you're angry with. So in denial of your anger, you are actually in the worst possible position from God's perspective. Mm. You are actually in a state where every single person around you is feeling what you should be feeling. You follow me? Does that make sense to everyone? Now the next step is I start experiencing my anger and owning it. As soon as I drop into that state, now those people are receiving less of my anger because I am now starting to experience some of it. Does that make sense yeah. to you? Even yeah. if you're directly expressing that anger to, to that them. person and yeah. hitting them with the baseball bat. Oh, no, you'd see, no, be very no, careful no, about no, that. No, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. No. You are now at least owning some of that within yourself. You, that is actually a better place. And I'm not saying hitting a person is a better place because that's a, you're doing a lot of bad things there, like to your own soul and to them. But, but actually beating the baseball bat, and even if you're laying and screaming and saying, F and whoever he is, you know, and you're doing that, that is actually a better place for you. You are actually projecting less at that moment than you were when you are in total denial. All right? Can I just keep going with this explanation? The next step down from that is realising that the whole reason why I'm angry with this person is in fact because there's a heap of grief or sadness or fear that's underneath it that I do not want to own. And while I'm in that state, all of this grief and fear is being projected out to everyone. When I step down into my grief, now I'm owning my grief and feeling my grief, now there is hardly anything going out to anyone. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you get to the point where now, deeper than that, you'll find some unworthiness. And when you're experiencing that, now there's hardly a single drop of it going out to the universe. You are now in full responsibility mode, feeling all of your emotions, and so therefore you are now no longer projecting it out to the universe. Does that make sense to everyone? It's important that, see, it's important that you get to see that this state is better than this state. Many of you think that's not true, but from God's perspective, that's true. This state is better than this state. This state, you, God can't do anything with you in that state. Can you see why? Because you're totally shut down from all emotion. God can't do anything with you. What's love? Love's an emotion. How is love going to enter you if you've shut down all of your emotion? It's not going to, is it? Now, as soon as you get out of that state into an emotional state, even if it is anger, you are now in a far better position, particularly if you talk to God about it. You are now in a far better position there than you were there. And everyone around you is in a better position there than they were there. And then when you step down even further into the denial of the grief and you realise that you've got a lot of blocks there, now you're even in a better space because you're not projecting the anger anymore, which means you're now taking more self-responsibility. Can you see it's a gradual step down and a gradual reduction of what you're sending out to the universe? Can you see that? Yep. That's it's what's nice. actually happening. So you are coming down from this state of total denial into this state of total acceptance of everything with inside you and as you drop down into each level you are actually projecting less damage to the universe less damage to your father or your mother or to you know whatever you know whoever it is that you've got these issues with but if you're not honest you'll never get there hey Jay, question. say you feel you don't have a connection with God yep is there any reason why you don't necessarily express anger you go straight to the feeling Identifying, for example, that you have an abandonment issue with God. There's no problem with going straight to that sort of thing. Not at all. Yeah. You remember, your anger is your choice to deny the underlying emotion. Yeah, but if you go straight to the underlying emotion, there's no problem in working straight on that. No, that's 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 fine. However, you will find that you may still have feelings inside of you that you're not allowed to be angry with God, when in reality you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you will need to experience that anger if that's the case. <coughs> Do you follow me? Like yeah. a lot of times, because anger is such a poor, like uh, such an emotion, we have so much judgment about. We we want to skip over the anger and get to the other, whatever that is. And I did this for many many years, right? 
And what I got left with was a group of emotions that I could never touch until I allowed myself to experience anger. Brian, I'm going to get angry at Brian. Right? You're right, Matt. So, so Brian just said something to me. He said, Say something nasty. Oh. <laughs> you can't think of anything. Yeah, yeah. So he's just said something nasty to me, and I just say, look, Brian, look, that comment just made me so angry, and I'm just going to have to leave this conversation with you and go and deal with that. Yes. Now. He may have a response to that as well. He might even get more angry with me doing that. But that's okay. I need to own the fact that I'm angry with him. Right? I need to own the fact that I felt this emotion. And when I own the fact and I say to him, Dad, how did you feel with me? I say that. How would you feel? <coughs> would that be better than me going, Fuck you, Brian! Much better. Yeah. Much better. Okay. So can you see how yeah. if I own it, that's going to, he's going to feel much better about that. I'm owning this anger. And if I go away and deal with that, I can then work out what it was. Now, it might even be that Brian said some really nasty things to me just then. And I could come back and say, you know, Brian, now I've dealt with all those nasty things you said to me. I don't feel angry with you anymore. But do you realise that they were pretty nasty, what you said to me? You know, so I can actually have that dialogue with him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Um, no, it's more that you need to do with your own unworthiness. Um, yeah, what I'm finding with myself is the more I deal with my unworthiness, the less the anger affects me. So, so what's happening inside of me now, as I'm dealing with my unworthy feelings, the anger is lessening and le the, the, the feelings when people are angry with me are lesser and I get less people angry with me as a result because my law of attraction is improving as well. Um, I, people are angry with me because I'm afraid of their anger. It's a first century related experience for me, like I've had lots of anger in my life and particularly in the first century it resulted in my own death and so lots of stuff associated with that. Usually when, uh, like usually when I really get angry is when I can't get away. But when, when I'm with somebody that's more powerful than me, like what happened to me when I was four and a half years old, I was sexually molested and I couldn't get away. And then I started, you know, like, or, or attraction was, I would get bullied, you know, over and over again. And then I'd start, you know, doing martial arts, but it didn't go away. Yep. And then I decided to stop doing martial arts and it did go away, but that fear of, you know, like things, emotional things that come up when I can't get away, still come up, although I'm not getting bullied anymore. Not happening, but you know, if I would and I couldn't get away, then that's what would happen. This so is the emotion that's being triggered for you. Yeah. The emotion is that you're not allowing yourself to actually feel the emotion in the place where you're there. Like, um, and the feeling is, I can't get away. I'm not allowed to get away. In fact, if if you if you said can't to not allowed, yeah. and this is the emotion that you need to work your way through. Once you work your way through that place, you'll feel like you can get away from any situation automatically. But that's the emotion that you're not letting yourself experience yet. So you have experienced a lot of the emotions of the abuse and a lot of the emotions of the things, but, but there's a lot of, there's, a, there's some of these subsequent emotions of feeling powerless with people that, that still need to be worked through. <laughs> very good question, very good question, and it, it is a beautiful question. Um, do you think God gets upset with you when you're angry with God? No. Why? Very happy working through it. 
Yeah, God's very happy you're working through it. Very happy. You see, from God's perspective, see, God, does God have any emotional hang-ups? No. The only time when somebody would punish us, so here's us, and we're directing anger at God. If God was a punishing God, then what would God do? How dare you get angry with me? You know, I'm going to destroy your life now. Like, you know, is that how, that's how what we picture sometimes God to be, isn't it? And in fact, that's what we've been taught. And how many religious viewpoints are there about that? Aren't they? Most religious viewpoints are about that. So even generationally, we have this belief in us about God. Truth is, God doesn't do that. Right? God will never, ever punish us for experiencing our emotion. God is love. And it's unconditional. You can't earn God's love. Now, that's a big thing, because most of you are so used to earning love. Right? Most of us are so used to earning love because that's what you've been taught. I'm going to love you, but only if you do what I want. <laughs> I'm going to love you, but only if you say what I want. I'm going to love you, but only if you agree with me. I'm going to love you, but only if you love me. <laughs> Isn't that how it is? <laughs> and God's not like that. God's already loving you. It's just that you can't feel it because of all of the blockages in your soul. You know, sometimes that's the way it is. I've just had what I call an aha moment. Um, <laughs> when a yeah. um, When you said um, about uh, God will only love you <coughs> and an if and all that sort of thing. <coughs> I find it amazing that the people around me, I'm getting better at it, the people around me all of a sudden think, you know, they want me around, they like my company, they say nice things about me, but I think, but I haven't done anything. And I just realize and I just realize that I don't have to do anything. I just am. And they're <coughs> You know, they're um, relating to me because I just am nice anyway. You don't have to do anything mm -hmm. to be yeah. accepted and appreciated. Yeah, can you see how much your feelings before of I have to do something to be loved? Yeah. Yeah. Is, it's a huge emotion. Mm -hmm. A huge emotion. Well, it is. Oh. And it, anger is a lot about that, by the way. When we project anger at another person, it is mostly because we expect them to do something for us that we believe they're not doing, how we want it. Does that, you know, that makes sense? Does that the commencement of a lot of relationship issues? Oh, totally, yeah. How many times do we enter a relationship because the person is already just giving us what we want? How many times do you enter a relationship with a person who's not giving you anything you want? <laughs> pretty rare to enter one of those relationships isn't it unless we have a lot of unworthiness or or we're opposite to that we can be in a condition of love where we can love everyone and and not feel like we need things from people and just getting back to God God's love is so beautiful that you will start understanding as you experience it that all of the things you were ever taught about love, the majority of them are not true. And once you realize that, you'll find that you can throw out most of the beliefs you have about love and just let God teach you what love really is. Could you give some examples of what love is as to what it's not? Example, yeah. Firstly, yeah, love is... More about that. Firstly, love is a gift. Yeah. Love is a gift. What's a gift? Something freely given. Yeah. Christmas time, what's normally happening? Are uh, many of the gifts gifts? No. Why? Because there's an expectation of? How many times have you given a gift in Christmas time? where you haven't got something back from that person. Right? 
if we're honest with ourselves, not many of us could put up our hands, right? Because most of the time we buy for our friends and they buy for us, and buy for our family, they buy for us. And what's actually happening? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it's not love, is it, really? Yeah. No? Rather, what, what, rather, rather kind of economics. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's, ex, it's expectation. Now, God's love is a gift. God wants to give this gift to you no matter what you are like. You could be the worst murderer murdering billions of people and God will still want to give you this gift. You cannot earn it either on the opposite side of things. So all this religious connotation that, you know, if you're faithful and you are do God's will and all those kind of things, none of that's true about God either. The truth is you cannot earn God's love because it's already just a gift. Hey, Jay, I sort of feel the other way around, that God loves me so much that he wants to earn my trust and he wants to earn my love, you know? And when I say that to other people, they think, oh, you should just be giving it, you know, faith and all that sort of thing. But it just seems like God loves me so much that he is prepared to do the hard yards, to push through all my crap, to actually earn my trust yeah. and earn my love. He doesn't actually have a feeling of needing to earn your love or trust. But he wants to. But he wants to. Yeah, he wants your love and trust, certainly. A big issue to talk to you about, actually. <laughs> and uh, this issue may trigger a lot of you, actually. And you may find you don't want to uh, come and see me anymore after this issue. So this is really interesting. Um, over the last uh, six to eight weeks, I've been obviously alone a lot dealing with a lot of my own emotions and uh, in the process of dealing with my emotions um, there's a lot of stuff of course that keeps coming up about um, my life in the first century my life now my plans for the future and so forth now you know and in those things um, because I've dealt with quite a lot of emotions of unworthiness in the process of the last six weeks and um, I wanted to talk to you about a lot of the projections that I get when I do these groups and and what kind of projections I've been getting because of my emotional condition but also it's because of your emotional condition as to what projections I get from you and I wanted to discuss some of those things with you so that you can connect to some of these emotions and, and have an idea of what you're going to do about them. Now many of these projections come from the fact of what I'm saying, who I'm saying my identity is. So I'm saying quite clearly to you that I am Jesus, the same Jesus that uh, was born in Nazareth in the first century and who happens to be in a lot of songs this uh, little silly season. <laughs> and, uh, and for many of you that brings up different emotions still. And many of you are still quite, uh, shall we say, undecided about that particular issue and I understand why you know obviously but what I'd like to do is talk to you about that indecision and where that's leading you and what's going on inside of you with it and I'd also like to talk to you about some of the projections that I'm getting surrounding that kind of indecision now one one projection that I'm getting is from the older ladies in your in the audience who want to mummy me now be honest, how many of you have felt that way? When I've been having a cry, how many of you have felt like you want to mummy me? Yeah, it's quite a few. There is quite a few. Um, now, the, the issue there, uh, there's quite a number of issues inside of that emotionally, if you think about it. Firstly, um, I already have two mums. <laughs> And I don't need more. <laughs> but two's the enough. <laughs> two's enough, yeah. Um, but the real, the real thing going on is actually, there's a feeling in you, uh, if you're trying to mummy me, there's this feeling in you of responsibility for your children. Do you know what I mean? Where you're feeling responsible for your children's emotions, and it's a quite a large emotion within you if you're feeling that towards me. The truth is, I've been around a couple of thousand years, and after the first 30, I didn't really need mummying much anymore. But there is an emotion coming from me, and there was an emotion coming from me, where every time somebody would mummy me, I would find it really condescending, 
and I would feel that it's quite... Um, the emotion often that I got from my mother in the first century was, I don't care who you are, son, you could be the Messiah and everything, but I'm still your mother. <laughs> now, what does that tell you when somebody says that to you? You know, don't you say anything, I'm still your mother. Like, what is that saying to you? Yeah, like, what it's really saying, isn't it, that, that if I, I feel that I can still boss you around because I brought you into this world, that's really the emotion there that's there. It's an emotion of ownership yeah. of children. And it's a very big emotion that needs to be eradicated from this earth, uh, is the emotion of ownership towards children. You see, when we set up a dynamic of ownership towards children, what we're actually doing is we're not saying they're God's children anymore. Right? We are saying they're our children, and then we are saying that we have the right to do whatever we wish with our children. So, so my suggestion is if you feel that emotion, allow yourself to feel why you feel they're yours. There's something to do with your identity tagged into that. Does that make sense to you? Where, where having this child as your child makes you feel different than if this child is God's child and all you're doing is caretaking it. But you want to feel that you're a good mother. Why? And because you just do. You want, you Why? Want, because you just do. I do. I want to feel that, that even though I'm this damaged little pea here <laughs> that's gone through so much that that somehow I can do some good through my children. All right, I want to feel I'm a good mum. Let's have a look at that statement. What am I really feeling? Bad. All the grief, all the stuff. I'm actually feeling I'm a bad mum. Yeah, but you actually feel you're a bad man if you're feeling yeah, that, I know, see? but this is it. Society says, I'm a good mum, I'm a good person. Exactly. So I want to be labelled as a good mum. Exactly. Yeah. So this is all about identity, uh, you know. In terms, there's some really core worthiness issues in this issue. Can you see that? Yeah. And And the, you see, often what we do is when the emotion we want is actually telling us the emotion that we feel happens to be the opposite. So, I want to feel happy. What do I really feel? And I'm not letting myself feel that. Right? I want to feel joyous. I want to feel love. What am I really feeling? I want to feel like I've got all the friends in the world. So, I create all of these interactions on you know, email, Facebook, going to different things with different people, so that I feel what? That I'm wanted. What am I really feeling? I'm wanted. And I'm not allowing myself to connect with these emotions. Can you see what we do with our addictions? We, we use these addictions to get over what we're really feeling. So what I'm suggesting to you is take notice of what you want to feel and then flip it over. Because the truth is, when you're at a state of bliss, you will no longer want to feel anything. You will just feel what you feel right now, whatever that be that makes sense to you. The desire to want to feel something means that you're not feeling it and therefore there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that emotionally for you. Okay. So what about um, the morality of, you know, badly treating children? You know, you know like, that's the thing you think I'm um, a little bit numb. I'm not going to beat them and I'm not going to whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, so, if society said you're a bad mum, then, then, then you'd go and beat them? No, no, okay. but you have the standards of how you treat people, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but I, what I'm saying is this true standard of treating anyone is God's love, right? Yeah. And what we're aiming for here is to treat everyone the way God treats everyone. Now, that's going to mean me letting go of a lot of definitions of what's right mm -hmm. and actually accepting God's definition of what's right. Well, how did God raise you? What? <laughs> it's an 
interesting question though, isn't it? Because how God raised you is how you should raise your children. Good, so God provided an environment where you could thrive. God, what, God provided somebody else said free will. So God gave you the ability to choose whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted it. What was the correction system God put in place? The law of attraction. So God put in place a correction system, not based on punishment, it's just based on there's consequences to actions that are unloving. It's not a punishment system where I'm going to make, you know, you do one thing wrong and you get punished for 25 others. <laughs> it's not like that. It's just a correctional system that God put in place to correct you when you've stepped out of the laws. These are the ways you need, these are the things you need to implement with your children. That is what's going to make you a good mum or dad. But in reality, whose child is it? God's. So who's the mum or dad that you're trying to emulate? God. So let's do that. Not society's way. So society will tell you that if you give your child free will, that's a very bad thing. Until they're 20 or 18 or whatever age it is that they've come up with, right? So AJ, if I go home and I tell my grown-up daughter and son all about what happened here today, I'm going to try and do it in a way that I'm not shoving it down their throats, but I, I honestly want them to start on the path. Does God want you to start on the path? Yes. How did God lead you to the path? By somebody telling me about you. Oh, was it really? Go deeper than that because there's a lot going on here about that. Was it really that? What was happening in you first? Okay, I was, I was seeking. You were seeking truth, were yes. you not? Yes. First. Yes. Here. Yes. Then somebody told you yes. about so the path. So I had the law of attraction. Somebody came and told me something and then it went on from there. Exactly. Exactly. So, so how is that going to happen with your children? What are they going to probably need to see first? Your example. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said the DVDs? <laughs> Spot on. The transformation in you. I think they're starting to see that because my daughter actually asked if she could come up and meditate with me the other night. That's what you need to and take advantage of. That's all right. Just let the change in you guide them. Yeah. Right? If they're not asking you, what, what's, what's God's principle? Ask, <coughs> and she'll receive. Uh, but you got an. No, this is emotion in you. This is emotion. This is emotion in you, yes. And what's the emotion? Yeah. I don't want them to have the pain I've had. But is that free will? What's free will? They're allowed to choose whatever they want, including the pain I had. That's free will. That's the way God brought you up. God said to you, you're allowed to choose all of these things. I've given you this gift of free will. And so... So, but when the child is asking, give them the explanations they need. Get, you know, sit down with them and watch the DVD or something that explains the whole universe. Let them just think about that. You don't need to actually say much. They will be drawn or not drawn based on... And this is how, this is how by the way, any children that pass in the spirit world, this is how they're brought up in the spirit world. They're given choices constantly. And their desire drives what is given to them. So my best mummy thing I can do for them is just to live my life in the truth. God's live your life in God's truth. Change yourself. As you change yourself, automatically certain emotions in them are going to be triggered because mum's changing. Right? They'll, treat, they'll trigger certain things inside of them. They will then have to deal with those emotions. They will probably deal with them. They'll probably come to you and say, Mum, gee, you've changed lots. Like, I really love you now. Like, you're so much like whatever it is that they're feeling from you. Less pressure, less like less pressure to conform to what you want and they'll feel those things and be drawn to it that way they're not going to be drawn to it by you saying come here and sit down with me and yeah, I'll just no, I've tried that. Doesn't it doesn't work, work. So I'll just, yeah, okay, understand. Doesn't I work. also I also took back my anger I owned my anger to my children yeah I owned my anger with Jeffrey own my up to what son. you've done 
own up to what you've done. So with Nick, with Nicholas, my younger son is 24, he's ferociously angry all the time. I went to him and I said, this is not your anger, Nicholas. This is my anger from when you were tiny little. And my other son, Jeffrey, who's now 28, suffers from depression and anxiety. And when I found the anxiety and the depression in me, I went to him and I said, Jeffrey, this, you don't, this is not yours. This is an imprint from me not being able to deal with my depression and anxiety. And you had no choice. I'm your only parent. You had no choice but to model it on me. And I took it back. And that really helped. It didn't solve the whole problem. But at least opened the gate. And we're talking about it and feeling with each other differently. Yeah, about an hour ago, AJ said something. And I thought, I would like to go to my son and say, I am sorry. I want to leave my guys in their own space when I was saying these things because I had no idea how they would handle it. So I left them in their own space. Yeah, yeah. What Jen's done has been really good actually because it, it demonstrates the importance of actually owning these different emotions. You beauty. You got some rain out. I'm not scared to own it. Yeah. Put some more in between it, yeah. they will just say, well, then it is your fault, I'm out of here, you know? But if you own it and say, this is a lot, yes, it is my fault, it'll just take all the wind out of their sails. And, you know, a lot of times antagonism between children and parents is all based around what we as parents do not own. Like, we just do not own enough of what we've done. And if we own it, things change really, really rapidly. About owning this, my daughter at age 17 became severely manic depression. Yep. And we went through almost 10 years of hell. Yep. Everybody's life turned upside down. Yep. And before that, it looked like her life was perfect and every, everything in our life was great. Yep. And it turned upside down. And now she's she hasn't been that way since uh, 2000. Yeah. Okay, she's doing great yeah. in her situation. Yeah. But what was, and I, I've, I've felt so much grief, so much pain, so much responsibility. Um, it was my fault that I created this. Yeah. And I've been try, trying in every way I can to fix it, to help, and make up for it. And what's and, and so I felt responsible for it, but yet I I also it's like she had she's got free will, she's got her own choices, and and one thing I've always been pretty good at I think is honoring her sovereignty and her free will from day one. Yeah, yeah. And and that's the only thing that keeps has kept me sane is knowing that this is a benevolent, orderly. Everything's benevolent. God is totally benevolent. The universe is orderly, mm -hmm. beautiful, mm -hmm. and she's got free will. Yeah. Yeah. So do I. But the 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 relationship between us and what I felt all this pain and grief of hurting some someone that, that I love so much. Mm. It's been it's been the most unbearable pain and grief. I could never imagine, felt. and there were points when I didn't want to live, mm. and I was so regretful of having a child, mm. yep. to cause this much pain to her, to me, to everyone involved. Yeah. It was so painful. And what you were going through was the law of compensation about, you know, the past. Does that make sense? Uh, the, I don't understand what you're uh, trying to say here. The law of compensation is a, is a law that whenever we do damage to another person, at some point in the future, we'll have to actually come to recognize the damage that we've done and truly feel it ourselves. Uh -huh. And so what you were actually doing in that process that you went through was you were feeling the damage that you've done to your daughter and allowing yourself to grieve over that damage that you've done. Yeah. And that is a very important part of your progression. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And it's, this is what the law of compensation is. The law of compensation is have us having to compensate for the damage we've done to others in our life. And the way we do that, there's two ways we can do that. One way is by going through that experience without God, or the other way is actually like bearing our soul, bearing ourself completely,
to God of all the things that we've really done in our lives that have damaged others and asking God for forgiveness of those things. Right? So, so you talk about manic depression, but it's the spirits affecting the person. Well, what's happened with your daughter is that there's a feeling of powerlessness that she has within herself that she had that really came about when she was 17. She's also mediumistic. So the combination of those two things occurred and she went into this state where she badly, badly wanted to feel powerful. And these spirits were willing to help her feel powerful. And so what they did is they supplied her with lots of energy which caused her high states. And where she went off the rails a bit and did all sorts of things, a lot of it was heavily spirit influenced because of that. But it was driven by an emotion that she felt within her that she was powerless before them. And that came from me. That came from yourself. Yeah. And and you know yeah. and her environment and her yeah. father and emotions there as yeah. well and yes. Yeah. So was that the law of compensation? I was I was The feelings you were going through, right, were the feelings of the law of compensation. In a later discussion, I'll talk about that we don't have to actually feel things in the law of compensation if we do it a different way, right? And that's to do with the law of repentance and forgiveness. Or what, you've heard of grace? Yes. It's a fairly common word nowadays, isn't it? Popular word. And we'll talk about that in another session, about divine love and grace and, and how that affects this whole process. <coughs> All right. Yeah, you don't actually bypass your own emotion in the process because that's not possible. But, but this process of clearing that emotion speeds up rapidly due to this interaction that you have between yourself and God and feeling repentant. Yeah. So the truth is that you still will feel some very painful emotions. But it, the law of compensation actually is about forgetfulness and it, and it takes many hundreds of years sometimes to forget these feelings. And this is why spirits who have passed, there's spirits who have passed in the spirit world who know they've done damage to their own children and a hundred years later they are still feeling the results of that damage that they've done to their own children. Right? Now they don't need to go through that process but they don't know of any other process and so that's what they need to go through until they learn the other process. My, my mother married my father and the day after she wished she hadn't and he was mentally ill. Yep. She stayed with him 42 years and had three children. Yep. This affected all of us tremendously. But Very I was 30 before I consciously knew that he had a problem. My mother covered it up yep. and, and I believe we had a perfect family. Yep. And that's my way of protecting myself. Yep. So, so what you're saying is my mother handed it down to me. I had all this stuff. I handed it down to my daughter. You've now broken the cycle. Well, I want to break the cycle. You have. Yeah. Already. You have because you went through the law of compensation about what you've done to your child. Straight away that changes the dynamic. Whether you did it with divine love or not, it's immaterial. You've actually gone through the law of compensation. Straight away that's changed the dynamic with your children. Straight away. So the grief was worth it. when children pass a little while ago, what happens when they get in the spirit world? Do they, are they still children? Yeah. Do, for how long? As long as they want. Okay. Uh, my grandchildren from the first century are still children. Okay. And there's people there that continue to raise them for hundreds of years? No, no, no. They, no. Like within a few years, not even a few years of our time, they are totally self-sufficient. They don't need anybody helping them whatsoever. They're two years old and... They're two years old and within like within two or three years they are totally self-sufficient. Okay. They do not need any single person helping them, including the person that helped them when they first passed. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. These children grow so rapidly, you'll be so surprised. You'll meet some of the, if if some of your own children have passed, you'll meet them and you'll be blown away about what they can teach you. Mm -hmm. Right? And you'll you'll be thinking of there's my child, but then you're thinking, gee, where's that? like you'll be quite confused because you think Gee, they know all this stuff I got no idea about. <laughs> you know. And they still have a little two-year-old form. Yes. And they'll be. If they want one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but my my grandchildren uh, like look like about eleven or twelve years of age, okay. and uh, they're they're at the twenty-second sphere state. Okay. Right. Thank you. So. Why would they want that? Okay. 
I don't know. <laughs> like, I, like you can talk. I can talk to them all they want, but understanding why they want that, I don't know. And um, you know, a lot of times it's because they don't feel any need to be any older. They like their form. They like how it is. They feel good in it. It's not necessarily a blockage. No, no. Uh, it's, a, it's due to desire. It's due to what they really desire. They're allowed to have what they desire.